Hey everybody, it's Tab. Just wanted to let you know that uh, we're going to be talking about a CPTSD fundamental today, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences survey, as well as where the information comes from and how it impacts you. Um, and I'm going to be talking about my own experience with ACEs and how it's impacted me, so hopefully I won't cry, but I, uh, I might. So, see you inside. Welcome to the CPTSD podcast, everybody. I am Tabitha Bird Weaver. I'm so glad that you're here and allowing me to host you um, through this process of recovery that you are currently, the journey that you're on. Um, I am grateful for the information that we're going to be talking about today because of a couple of things. First, it really gave us a different way of looking at child abuse and neglect and, um, and, and therefore trauma. And so this study that we're going to be talking about in just a minute changed the landscape of trauma treatment and, and understanding how recovery is possible and why and where and how. And so it is really, really helpful. Um, it's a little depressing also how common this is. And so I'm grateful that this information is being made more and more prevalent in public so that we can counteract it because adverse childhood experiences are absolutely preventable. They are preventable. And for all of you cycle breakers out there, thank you. That is what you are doing, is preventing adverse childhood experiences, even if you're not perfect. Okay, so um, there's a little bit of a trigger warning today because we're going to be talking about really painful topics that a lot of us have experienced. And so if that doesn't feel okay for you, now's the time to bow out. I'd encourage you to stick around because the information is more hopeful than distressing. Okay, so we're going to start with the distressing stuff first, though. All right, so what is an adverse childhood experience? Well, I mean, fundamentally, it's anything that could be traumatic to a kid, right? And so let's just pause for a moment, moment and remember that one thing I've said repeatedly and other people say all the time is that trauma is subjective. And what that means is your experience is the only one there is. And if it's traumatic, then it's traumatic. It doesn't matter if it meets somebody's criteria. It doesn't matter if it um, matches somebody else's bad experience. There will always be somebody worse than you and better than you as far as traumatic experience goes, right? There's always going to be somebody with a harder story. That does not mean yours doesn't hurt. All right, so... I want to tell you that the ACEs survey is not the original study that we're going to be talking about today. It's the outcome of that study. It's the questions that we know we need to ask now, okay? So when we talk about the study, it's not the survey. Uh, the survey is the gift that the study gave us, uh, one of many. And so way back in the 90s, time travel, um, way back in the 90s, Kaiser Permanente did a study um, trying to understand any connection between negative childhood experience or painful childhood experience and chronic or you know bad health outcomes later in life and so they did a study and found that holy mackerel there was a correlation and in fact it was such a big correlation that the centers for disease controls paired with them and expanded the study and so the information that I'm talking with you about today since the 90s has literally interviewed millions of people at this point because it is a standard protocol that we have put into healthcare. So the study from Kaiser um, is not the foundational information we're going to be talking about today. And there's two, it's this foundation has grown and developed. And so what I'm going to be telling you is accurate, but I want to acknowledge a couple of things. The first thing is the original study was 76% of the participants or something like that number were white. And that really skews how we assess and understand things. Right? Also, this study was created to try and save money when providing health care. Okay, so those two kind of negative things aside, 
um, that does not contaminate the data that we're talking about today because there was a, a basically a dragnet put in to our healthcare system that asks questions during certain situations. And so now we have solid information across populations, multiple populations. So it's not just white people or it's not just straight people. It, it is well spread out. I'm going to put a couple of links in the description below so that you can go to this page and check out all these facts. You don't have to write it down or remember. Okay. Um, so the facts I'm going to tell you now are coming from the CDC's website. <clears throat> so here we go. I'm going to take a sip of water. I'm kind of flying through it. Average childhood experiences, as I was saying, are things that could potentially be traumatic. Okay, it's going to depend on a couple of different things, how much trauma you've already had, your frame of view and your experience personally that happens, as well as the environment that you're in. And so for the sake of clarity, if you think it counts for you, it counts. Okay, uh, you don't have to make sure that your trauma is bad enough to count. All right, so we've got a couple of different themes that go with this study or this survey, and I'm going to tell you the survey questions in just a minute. I'll also put them up on the YouTube. So if you are a visual person, head on over there and watch it there. Um, also, this is in the um, CPTSD Treatment 101 Definitive Guide that we have for free for you to download. So if, I'm just wanting you to feel what we're talking about rather than trying to keep track of facts. You can go get those things and it'll all be right there for you. So kids who experience violence, abuse, or neglect towards them, that is a, a, a potentially traumatic experience, right? Witnessing violence in the home or community is potentially traumatic, as well as having a family member attempt or die by suicide. So those are three very clear things that we know harm kids. Also things that are potentially harmful are substance use and mental health issues um, that are not regulated or managed or, you know, they're undiagnosed, so they're just unhealthy people and hurt people that are raising kids, um, and there's a lot of us, um, or instability in the household, either from parental separation, um, or a child is removed from the home, or a, a parent goes to jail, um, or sometimes the loss of a job can also be a trigger there. So this isn't a complete list. We're gonna be talking about the specific questions in just a moment. But before that, I want to talk with you for just a sec about how big the problem is. It's an epidemic. And I'm, I'm not being dramatic. It is an epidemic. ACEs are common about, I'm reading to you right now, about 64% of U.S. adults reported that they had experienced at least one type of uh, adverse childhood experience before 18, and nearly one in six, so that 17% of us, reported we had experienced four or more. So 17% of our kids are experiencing four or more traumatic experiences. And in my experience as a re survivor and also as a therapist, it's not for individual experiences. It's four types of things happening over and over and over and over. You don't get neglected or abused once. All right, so the first thing that I want to talk with you about is called the ACEs Pyramid or the ACE Pyramid. And this is basically the, the hierarchy of how we are harmed, okay? So what this study found is that the foundation of the majority of ACEs is going to be in generational embodiment or historical trauma. So if you are born into either a long-standing abusive family line or if you are born into a category of people who is mistreated and oppressed and have a history of trauma, then it's worse for you. There's a foundation of suffering and exposure to violence that is not experienced by everybody else. So one example of that would be the black experience in the United States. 
The next is not necessarily your heredity and what you were born into, but what you're living in now. So the social conditions and the local context. So somebody who is growing up in a wealthy suburb who does not have the same level of violence as somebody who is growing up in a more um, impoverished area where people have been segregated, uh, those have different outcomes. It doesn't mean the person who is in the wealthier context this is just an example. Wealth is a big one, though. The wealthier context does not mean that abuse and neglect and suffering isn't happening. It means you don't have to deal with not having enough money or having guns that are on the street right next to you. And by the way, that's not just urban. There are guns all over where I live in a rural area. So I'm just saying we can't really stereotype other than to know that social class and the local context that you grow up in matters to your level of trauma. Okay, I could, I could uh, preach, but I'm not going to go there right now because that's not our focus. Next is the specific experiences that we're going to talk about. If you have any of those specific experiences, then you are more likely to suffer longer consequences. Um, and those consequences are disruptive neuro, disrupted neurodevelopment. So your nervous system cannot grow the way it needs to. And that's damage. There's also social, emotional, and cognitive impairment because if you're always hungry, it's hard to learn at school. And I'm just giving some examples along the way, right? If you have only rage in your house it's hard to know how to do anything else <laughs> with other people so there's social problems right next there is the adoption of high risk behavior and for those of us with cptsd this is part of what has harmed us our own behavior okay that may not be where the responsibility for the the suffering lies but we extended our own experience because of our frame of reference, right? So I have been hurt way more times in my life by people's experience of me than I probably needed to because I misunderstood the social context. I was ready to be criticized, like usual, but it wasn't happening. All right. Also, because our nervous systems are dysregulated, we don't feel good about ourselves, and by now our bodies are probably hurting, we have a high tendency to self-medicate and have substance issues that come up for us, including um, the substance of sugar. So don't, don't uh, be hesitant to look at your sugar consumption if you have CPTSD. Um, also, those are the things that we were taught to do. And I think right now I'm realizing I'm going to need to do a segment on how trauma is transmitted. Um, so I'll do that in my upcoming um, podcast for you. Getting back to it, after this high-risk behavior that I'm talking about, guess what? We get disease, disability, and continued social problems right if we are if we have an eating disorder because we weren't taught how to regulate emotions except through food and our society is remarkably fat phobic that's a social problem right and it can also be more interpersonal more individual but disease happens also because our bodies are starting to break down from the longevity of stress hormones going on so again I could talk about every one of these pieces for 20 minutes and maybe I will I'm just trying to breeze through for us right now but because we've moved from to who we were born to where we lived experiences in our own life our disrupted environment and our disruptive neurodevelopment then impairment because we're hurt and injured and then because we're hurt and injured we adopt coping mechanisms to help us be okay and some of those are more healthy than others right but for the unhealthy ones like any substance abuse overeating over exercising chronic adrenaline you know type a personalities whatever 
your coping mechanism is, it adds to the suffering of your body because it keeps us in an adrenalized state and that adrenalized state creates disease in our body. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute and that disease in our body creates early death. And so this is no joke, folks. Um, it's an epidemic and I'm gonna, I just got a little teary there, but I'm gonna pull it on back in. So here are some additional thoughts. Let me, um, I'm pulling up an article right now from Baylor University and I just wanted to let you know specifically the health conditions associated with ACEs. Um, I'll put this link in the description. And I'm going to read right now. So number one, uh, these aren't necessarily in order. It's just the order on their website. First, autoimmune disease. Hello, that's me. Among patients with lupus, 63% reported having one or more ACE and nearly 20% had four or more. Those are statistics you can't ignore. And even though we don't find causation, which means this is what causes lupus, there's correlation and correlation counts, okay? Next, cardiovascular disease. Strong association between ACE and cardiovascular disease. COPD, strong association, okay? Diabetes, 32%. ACE exposure increases the risk of type two diabetes by 32% compared to patients with no ACE scores. Cancer. I mean, cancer, I'm just, depression and substance use, 30% more likely to binge drink alcohol. We take the harm that was done to us. I'm just going to lecture for a second on substance abuse or all of these things. We take the harm that was done to us and self-perpetuate it. This isn't, this isn't, I'm not blaming us. It's the system, that's how this works. That's how it continues to the next generation. And so this isn't a, a call for you to be responsible for your healing, although I don't know who else is going to do it, <sighs> but you. This is just saying it's not our fault that we're not okay. There's a big movement right now, well, it's not big enough in my opinion, but it'll get bigger, I think, to stop saying PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and say PTSI, post-traumatic injury. Because it is an injury. All right, that's enough lecturing. So we're gonna head over to, let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, the definitive guide, I'm gonna put it up so you, you can see the ACEs questions. And I'm scrolling, almost there. Okay, here we go. So if you can pause for a minute and go to a place where you can like make a check mark or think about this a little more seriously, this might be a good time for you to take some inventory. So here we go. First question on the ACE. Did you feel that you didn't have enough to eat you had to wear dirty clothes, or you had no one to protect or take care of you before you were 18. May I remind you, you don't have to prove that that happened. Just do you feel like it happened? Number two, did you lose a parent through divorce, abandonment, death, or another reason? Or a caregiver, primary caregiver, if it wasn't your parent? Did you live with anyone, number three, sorry, did you live with anyone who is depressed, mentally ill, or attempted suicide? Did you live with anyone who had a problem with drinking or using drugs, including prescription drugs? We're talking about misuse of prescription drugs here, okay? Did your parents or adults in your home ever hit, punch, beat, or threaten to harm each other? Did you live with anyone who went to jail or prison? Did a parent or adult in your home ever swear at you, insult you, or put you down? 
Did a parent or adult in your home ever hit, beat, kick, or physically hurt you in any way? Including spanking. Did you feel that you had no one in your family who loved you or who thought you were special? And last one. Did you experience unwanted sexual contact, such as fondling or any? I'm going to back that fondling out. Have you ever experienced any unwanted sexual contact? And if I were you, I would include that experience you have where somebody's leering at you or you don't want to hug that uncle or aunt, right? All right, so I want to come out and let you know now <clears throat> my experience with ACEs. And I have eight on this list. And it's possible there's nine, but I'm not sure if uh, anybody ever went to jail. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's possible. Eight is a lot, and it has 100% impacted me in all the ways we've been talking about. I have gone through a large part of my life feeling alone in a crowd, if you know what I mean. Like, I just feel like I couldn't connect all the way. And part of that is a safety mechanism for me. I'm talking about me right now, so that I don't get close and get hurt. Because in my experience, a lot of the people who were supposed to be caring for me hurt me. And that's true for about 64% of us. Remember that statistic? And 17% of us got hurt a lot. So at four aces, it's almost guaranteed you're going to have a chronic health problem of some sort. It could just be achy, rickety bones, right? But with that much distress to your nervous system, to your myofascial system, to your brain, when it was so fresh and needing protection and support and nurturing, we got hurt. Now that I understand this and can put my own experience in context, um, it's relieving. I spent so much time trying to, so much time trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And I, I there was something wrong with me. I've been hurt, right? But it wasn't my fault. And I think that's what I was trying to figure out is what did I do to make all of this happen? And if you have any kind of chronic pain or illness, I know you understand the hamster wheel of why am I having a flare up? What did I do? And sometimes the answer is nothing. So I wanted to come out of the closet with some of my health experiences because this 100% impacts your physical health and I'm almost at a half hour, so dang, I'm gonna move through this. Because it's not, it is about me, but it's about us. And I want you to take care of your whole being, including your body that has gotten you this far and has kept you safe. That body needs love. So does your mind, your spirit, your being. But I think in CPTSD, we really don't always understand the, the distress and the harm, the damage that's been done to our literal bodies and our brains. I think the very first thing that happened health-wise for me is chronic earaches at two. Uh, tonsils removed, four or five. Um, horrible growing pains and that that could purely be physical and from other like hypermobility things but really a lot of pain night terrors growing up feeling like there was somebody hovering in the corner right above me staring at me while I slept I used to perfectly make a little hole right here so I could have cool air going into my nose <laughs> um, I don't like hot air so there's that 
even though I'm full of it. Oh my gosh, but a dump bump. And another coping mechanism is to use humor to deflect the fact that I am so sad. I have experienced these things. And I'm sad if you have too. So, um, menstruation on set was horrible. I had the worst periods. I remember falling asleep many times with a heating pad clutched to my abdomen and irregular as well. And so now we're looking at PCOS, which by the way, is really affiliated with insulin resistance. Okay, so now we're kind of dipping our toe into that type two insulin resistant diabetes, all right? Um, when I was 16, I was having upper GIs done because I had so much stomach and stomach pain, so much stomach pain. Um, they thought I had an ulcer and I did, I had an ulcer. Um, Cut mono in high school and that was the death nail for my immune system. I have never recovered from that. I've had mono four times, which I am told is impossible, <laughs> but there it is. Um, the tests show it. And that's because of, of Epstein-Barr virus, uh, 2012. Uh, so that's been for 40 years. Uh, 2012, I was diagnosed and treated for breast cancer, which is, I'm clear still from that, but that sucked. I also uh, caught COVID in May of 2022 and have not recovered. Uh, I am better in some ways. It's not as acute as it has been, but I'm not okay from that. And then this last March, I had my gallbladder removed, which I felt instantly better after having that. I do not regret that at all. Um, I regret that I had to do it. This stuff is real. It impacts your body. It impacts your, your mind. It impacts your relationships. We'll talk about those another time. I just wanted to encourage you that if you have any of these experiences and you do consider them traumatic, please also care for your body and your brain. Okay, not your mind, that, that too, do care for your mind, but your body and your brain deserve and need the support and if you have been wondering what the heck is wrong with you and why you always catch everything or why it, why your health is always the worst in the room that you're in, this could be your answer. This could be the thing that started it all. So all of this is tragic and sad and hurts, literally hurts, right? Fibromyalgia, I'm convinced it's part of this whole process. I can't prove that. I'm just saying I'm convinced. I have not ever treated somebody who does not ache in one way or another. So what can you do about that? There's some good news that may terrify you, but I want you to sink into it. All right. One of the best things for CPTSD is forming community, being in community. And if you're an introvert like me, that is not that easy to do, but it's really important because our experiences and our traumas will indeed make us want to avoid things that are uncomfortable because it's not safe and we're on high alert. So find a community. I really do think locally is important because being able to be in the presence of people in the flesh is a very grounding experience for a lot of us. A lot of times it's terrifying. So if this is overwhelming to you, you don't have to do anything. I'm just telling you that studies show people who live in community have way better health outcomes all across the board than people who are isolated. And our, our injury makes us want to isolate. So if you're not ready to go out and find a group of people to meet, you know, live, that's okay. There are other ways you can find community. I think a really great way to find community is online. And there are a couple different ways. You can go join a group where it you all do the same thing. And so you have that in common, right? So 
there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, there's meetups, there are ways that you can lurk, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but you know, I'm a wallflower when I'm figuring out what's going on, right? So any type of online discussion group that you can join, if you feel safe in it, is going to be helpful, right? I also have a group that you can join. It's, there's no cost. It's just a group of us who get it. <laughs> and now this group is a little bit more on the uh, spiritual end of energy. So just know that before you come in. But please come check out Karmic Alchemy community. We are getting rolling with just insights, resources. There's a question and answer thread in there if you want to ask me anything. So finding yourself a community or multiple communities is really important and please understand also that could be one person for right now or two right it could it could be a small community that's okay another thing that is really helpful for those of us on this road of recovery is to recognize that our signals of worthiness of self-care of self-nurturing are often backwards when we start this journey and sometimes even midway I'm still discovering things I've been doing this a long time and I'm still discovering areas where my perception is not accurate and that's just part of humanity it's not all from one perspective right you may not understand how deep the damage is to your physical being and I would really encourage you to find a doctor who can help you with that if you don't have one Find a community where you can learn about that and you don't necessarily have to show up and participate, but you deserve for your body to begin this healing journey too. I hope that this has been helpful for you and I look forward to talking with you and sharing with you as we move forward. Until I see you again, take it easy and keep it light.